Arteta! What a strike! It's time to talk about Project Big Picture. And no, that's not the thing where I took a week to think about my shitty hot takes. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right. We took a week off. Rest and recuperate after what I think was a very well-received podcast about Thomas Party signing. Certainly, uh, uh, I thought... A, a balanced view that everybody seemed to get on board with. So I was happy for that. And we have uh, cleared the chamber, so to speak. We've, we've taken the week off, uh, as has football that anybody particularly cares about, in the effort to allow some stories to build up. And thankfully, some stories have built up. But if you are as excited as I am to watch Thomas Party play football for Arsenal, and you need to understand what kind of player this is, we have now done two video scouting sessions with Clive for patrons. They are um, really kind of neat because they're very different looks the first scouting session is best action so uh hollywood passes over the top and through balls and beating a man and things like that the second one is more defensive positioning and 1v1s and under pressure and you really get a sense at a granular level of what this player is about as clive talks you through it with his dulcet tone so if you want to see that uh both of those both audio and video version are available for patrons, but we've got this pod for you now where we will talk more about Thomas Party. We will talk a little bit about the squad that was registered for the Europa League and, and the uh, people that were included and maybe the people that were not included. Talk a little bit about the game coming up at the weekend and some of the broader issues facing football, uh, specifically the Project Big Picture I sarcastically referenced earlier. But before we do that, we should let you know that Tim is here. Come find him on Twitter. Stop. Hello, Tim. Hello there. And Clive is here. He's on Twitter at Clive BFC. Hello, Clive. All right. Well, let's get into it. And before we do, uh, you know, it was my intention today to just say that I hope everyone is doing well, um, that things aren't great all over the world right now. But I listened to the Arscast and Andrew did, uh, as ever, an articulate and eloquent job of referencing those issues and wishing everyone well. So I simply want to co-sign onto his message and leave it at that. So, Tim, let's talk uh, Project Big Picture just quickly. I think it's kind of a non-issue at this point right now because... The Premier League, including the clubs that even put it forward, have voted it down unanimously, uh, which Mm. is kind of humorous. But it's definitely not going away. Uh, The EFL needs money. Clubs are going to go out of business. COVID has created a problem that I think existed even before COVID, but has accelerated the issues that were underlying football. There is an issue with money in football. There is an issue with the way um, clubs cannot be run in a self-sustaining manner. And, um, you know, I think the business model of football is pretty badly broken. And there is a connection between tradition and history and community that football still feels very tied to, but it also doesn't sync up very nicely with the footballing business model that has developed. So I'm curious Mm. to get your take on whether this was the first salvo in what will wind up being a a more protracted battle to reshape English football um, to serve maybe some different needs. And, and to be fair, maybe enhance the longevity of, of English football for a certain segment of it, but also to to benefit a certain class of, of moneyed clubs. How do you feel about what this first salvo looked like and where this is going long-term? Yeah, so the, the first salvo is exactly the way to describe it. And uh, I guess the disappointment for me is that this is the first salvo. This is um, a topic that should have been... Dis- I, I, I appreciate that you know, Project Big Picture has been talked about for a few years, this is an urgent discussion that needed to happen before COVID. It is even more urgent now that the way um, the you know the football pyramid, as we call it in England, is run is not sustainable. It wasn't before COVID. It needed restructuring. Personally, I don't have the answers to that. I don't know how. Um, I don't know how that works or how that's going to work or what it's going to look like. Um, and for me, the shame is this is another one of those things where two things can be true at the same time. This is both an appalling um, flex of muscle um, from, you know, the likes of Liverpool, Manchester United. I think you can throw, you know, Arsenal in there as well. Um, but it also has a lot of good things in it. And you can see why. So the issue there, there are a couple of issues going on at once here. There's first off. There is the kind. There is this kind of thing when we have this discussion, particularly in England, that I think most people recognise that the structure doesn't work um, in 2020, and something needs to happen. But every time there's a suggestion, we go, "No, you can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that." And so we don't go anywhere. Mm. Um, 
So, but at the same time, I, I, I want to put that context in because um, I do, I guess, kind of oppose most of this because, you know, if the money exists and, and so now we know the money exists for the Premier League to bail out EFL clubs, right? They've said it exists. Um, just pay it. <laughs> you mm. don't have to tie all of these like conditions that are very beneficial to you and make it very easy for you to to have a super league and and even doing stuff like approving new clubs owners so like like where do manchester city and chelsea get off telling other teams that they can't have billionaire benefactors which is part of what this is all about who who the fuck made man city and chelsea part of the big 6 like they're not part of the big 6 because of anything they did they won they got a, they like they won the lottery yeah um they don't have the right to tell other people how to govern their football clubs they found a lottery ticket on the floor yeah, I mean, if the, um, so if the Saudi a, purchase of Newcastle had gone through, would it be the big seven? Would they would they suddenly be in this conversation? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah precisely. And they're, and they're not, you know, and I, I appreciate as an Arsenal fan, it kind of sounds like, I, and maybe I'm being a bit superior in terms of like, well, actually, Arsenal have been at the top ta- table at a sustainable level over a number of decades. And that's, um, you know, that's through a lot of hard work and things like that. But that, that, that doesn't mean I think Arsenal have the right to, um, to you know, run the rule over all of this. The, the problem, I guess, is, the problem in terms of the discussion at a fan level is that we will re- we understand that something needs to change, but we will reject everything, basically, mm. <laughs> because we're quite resistant to change. But the, the bigger barrier um, and the reason like this shouldn't have been the first proposal because it is absolutely soaked in self-interest. But the bigger barrier we've got is that nobody is looking at quote unquote the bigger picture everybody is voting in every everybody's self-interested so even the efl clubs and i completely understand this by the way of course they're going to vote for it like why does south like south end and Tranmere? they don't care if like manchester united and arsenal go off and play in the super league they don't care about you know how the voting and the where the power sits in the premier league and oversee like it's not in their world it's never going to be in their world they're not going to be in the premier league they don't care they're just they're getting the bailout money and i completely understand why you know why that would be attractive to them and and what's um, not ironic i guess but significant about this is the reason it's not going anywhere is that basically of the 92 clubs there are there are definitely f- at least 12 in the premier league and probably six to eight in the championship who who don't want this because it is not in their interests um but the pertinent thing is because of the way the voting works in the Premier League, there are at least 12, probably 14 teams who don't want this. And so they have blocked it outright um, against possibly the, the interests of about 70 odd teams. Um, and that's why it's not going anywhere. And and really, I, I don't see how we break through that unless everyone starts thinking of ironically given the name of this the the bigger picture (laughs) and Manchester United and Liverpool and Arsenal stop just thinking about themselves and you know just tossing out the odd bribe here and there the EFL clubs just and I understand it more from their perspective because it is about pure survival um, but they stop just thinking well we don't care about the European Super League this means this pays our bills for a year like there needs to be um, and this is where where this should be heading for me is that there should be an independent regulator. Um, I, you know, I've done a bit of work in like fraud investigation and things like that. And I think the idea that industries regulate themselves is a fucking nonsense. They can't and they won't do it. Um, and football needs, I think, an independent regulator. And um, it, it kind of shows how broken football is and how. Uh, you know how much it's just become the free market that basically the big boys have come in and just said, well, we'll we'll toss out some bribes so that we get our way. That isn't how this should be broached. This should have been broached by um, someone with a, a, a fair amount of objectivity and, you know, to come up with a deal or a, propo- a proposal that works for as many teams as possible. Um, and and I, I guess you could argue this actually works for at least 70 75 out of the 92 clubs and that's not a bad hit rate but um that yeah what 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 needs to happen is there needs to be some mediation here and this is um i think i i referred to it on twitter this week as uh football's answer to climate change Mm. this is an urgent discussion and it has to happen now and every day and week it is delayed during this winter clubs will go to the wall um and and it's just a shame to me that 
really that the best starting point that we have came from completely naked self-interest. And it's no surprise to me that the plan came from the American owners because no. the English football pyramid makes no sense to an American business person. It just doesn't. And this is the real issue, I think, with reshaping English football. It is steeped in tradition and history. And there is a real question about whether that tradition and history is compatible with the business model that has been built once the Premier League was created. Because the Premier League is the professional football league in England. Don't talk to me about the championship, League One, League Two. They're not it. It's the Premier League. Globally, the Premier League is the brand. And that brand is dragging six other levels of football behind it like a ball and chain attached to its leg. It is doing that because of literally centuries of tradition and history and and it, things that I can't connect to that certainly Tim, you and Clive uh, could, could speak to more articulately and, and with... Uh, greater level of information and understanding. But the problem is that once you create the Premier League, there is an incompatibility, a misalignment of incentives because you have this professional league that is a global juggernaut and yet it has money and voting rights and all kinds of things flowing down the line to other teams that one year are in that professional league and one year they're not in that professional league and they have totally different interests. Mm. Let's be honest, at the championship level, there are only a few clubs now that even compete to try to go up. It's not like it used mm-hmm. to be. Teams aren't... I, I was listening to another podcast where they talked about this. It might have been the athletic one. Um, you know, they're not they're not spunking cash on their squads in the championship no. chasing the riches of the Premier League anymore. Go, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. And Le- Clive, we got to get you Yeah, in I was going to say, like, Leeds are up. Villa are up. Like, a lot of the sleeping giants have come... So, Leeds would kind of do it. Well, actually, the irony is Leeds came up at the point they stopped doing that. They just Mm. hired a good manager. Villa were doing that. But you've got fewer of those like sleeping giants in the championship who are really chasing it hard now. Yeah. And so you have an incompatibility of, of incentives and alignment. And like, while I think Project Big Picture is nonsense, I also can't really... I mean, let's let's be honest, guys. Clive, if you were sitting down and you're like, "We're going to create a professional football league in England," and you're you're a brand new person, this has never existed, you would not in a million years create the structure that exists now. It's a nonsense from a business standpoint, but it is an incredibly important tradition within the footballing culture, the country within which it exists. So, how do you align the clearly evolved business incentives and and goals of Premier League clubs, particularly at the top, who are generating a tremendous amount of revenue, and align that with this traditional footballing structure in the country. Because to me, there is a clear conflict between those two things, and I don't know that it can be resolved to, to everybody's benefit. Um, so how, how do you see that conflict being resolved, or do you, do you think it just has to continue the way it does? <laughs> No, mate, this is such a big topic. I don't know where to start. Fair enough. Well, and, think, and you're a coach probably, down, the, you know, down the pyramid. Like, you you are connected to all of this, you know, at the other end of right. it, you know? So, well, yeah, there's so many competing views and, you know, Tim G's words like self-interest and independent bodies, and they're, they're great words, but even the independent bodies may have Gary Neville on it and we'd wonder about his independence. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Football is the global game. It is the glo- it is the world soap opera, and I'm not sure anyone's truly independent. I'm not sure anybody is truly doing it for the right reasons. Although that idea of football governing itself appropriately and properly is one we all should aim for, but we all got suspicions. I mean, Rick Parry's job movements say all they need to say, right? So um, his involvement in Liverpool. I mean, Tim said who are Man City and who are Chelsea. Well, at least will one or two Premier Leagues. Or, or first division championships, but they haven't won one for 30 years. And funny now, they've just won one. They're piping up to try to make sure they can keep control of their position when a few years ago they were in mid table, basically, you know, and throwing money away and making mistake after mistake after mistake. And that is football. It is a competition. And what worries me mostly is the art of competition could go. I very much agree with what Arthur Wenger said. Football is about hope and feelings, competition. One day you hope you can do something. If you take that hope away, you take away the essence of the game for me. And I think it should always be there for people. Have the ability to compete. We know it's a money game now. And that ability is less and less. And we speak about sleeping giants like uh, in the championship, like Derby County and 
you know, um, Nottingham Forest, European Cup winners, Nottingham Forest sitting there in the championship, teams like Coventry and Ipswich have been up in the top leagues. There's so many teams down the league, Sunderland, that want to come back, want to come back big and need the opportunity to do so. You know? And then below the 92 clubs, there's four other leagues of non-league leagues that are due, that are FA administered. And all of those leagues are flourishing. Gates are up as you'd expect. And there are people that hugely rely on these clubs as part of their community. They're run by volunteers. The football structure in this country, and anybody who's been on the motorway on a Saturday, and Tim knows what I mean when I say this, there are flags and scarves hanging out of cars for the whole day, coming from all sides of the world. It's what we do. It's how we live. It's, and I think we should do everything in our power to sustain it. But it does need to be sustainable. There does need to be rules, waste caps, etc. Because the Premier League has taken ambition to a point where everyone's trying to follow it, they're overstretching themselves, and clubs are finding it very difficult to be sustainable because it's like mini Premier Leagues developing below. And this is feeding all the way down to non-league where non-league players have agents, would you believe it? Mm. You know, they really do, right down in the step that I'm at. And it's just a, a mirror image of what's happening at the top end of the game. And not all that's healthy. You know, so, um, but yeah, I think what we're trying to do, Project Big Picture, is uh, I don't really care what it's called. The conversation needs to start, and it, and it does need to start. A few years ago, remember that B-team conversation that Danny Mills was involved with and all those guys? Mm-hmm. I didn't laugh at that then. I thought, I thought, this is good. We need to have this conversation. And everyone laughed them out of the room. You shouldn't have laughed them out of the room. The conversation should not have stopped. You need to continue. Not behind curtains that are twitching. You need to continue. And people laughed at them because they, they bring their own self-interest. We don't want to change. We don't want to do anything. Well, why can't we have B teams? Why can't we have a different structure? Why can't we look at it? Everything should be on the table because the world has changed. The world has changed. And I like these conversations. Yes, they're a bit holy. Less they reek of self-interest. Yes, it, it, it's easy to pull it apart. But someone needs to have it. And we need to get out there and keep talking, keep talking until we reach a spot with where it's actually better and more acceptable, more palatable to more people. The government are not going to step in to help these EFL clubs. They're sitting there throwing stones of football and its governance. But what are they doing to help these clubs that are having that are forced to have no fans in due to government rules? They're not doing anything. So at least you're going to step up and do something. Keep your mouth shut as far as I'm concerned. We're trying to, football is trying to do something in a clumsy way and it's not great. Mm. But we've got to have these conversations because I live near an area of I live near, near between Luton and Stevenage and Bedford is where I live. And so you've got Luton Town trying to build a new ground. Um, I don't know where they are financially, but I don't know I've got big plans for a new ground. That's probably going to be frozen. You've got Stevenage League 2, not anywhere in their ground for how many months. You know, they still bought a player today on the, on the transfer deadline day. So you have to do your business. You have to keep progressing. You have to be moving forward. But these clubs are struggling. You know, they're struggling. And who's going to help them? I don't see anyone putting their hands up, right? So I think these conversations, I really, really embrace them, even if they're wrong, even if they're incorrect, even if they're a bit lopsided, even if they're driven by self-interest. We've got to have them. We can't be afraid to have them. We can't be afraid of change. We can't be afraid of ripping up what we've grown up with. Right, we've got it's going to take outside it. the box thinking, right, Clive? This this is not a problem you're going to fix just by leaning on the traditions that have carried you for a century. Yeah, exactly. I remember, let's just think about traditions, right? And they, traditions change. I'm just bringing back to a little bit of football, right? But do you remember when <laughs> when Chelsea first got a brand reach in, I said to myself, they're not going to overtake us. <laughs> no chance, no chance. Now look at all the numbers, look at the revenues, look at the trophies. Remember Man City bought Rubinho? I laugh, never going to happen, no one's going to go there. Now look at them. Things can change in a flick of a switch. It really can and that's probably what's brought this conversation around, actually, that the fact that they fear that there's so much money to be made from the Premier League and its pay-per-view, and that we've not tapped into this league yet. I mean, the first, I think the first TV deal was like 300 plus million, and now what, five north of five billion, you know? So we haven't started yet what we can really do with this Premier League. If you were to, you know, pay-per-view, single tickets for, for teams, this, this is how you just died in YouTube generation when people, I'm not... People laugh at us for watching full games when we rewatch them. Because not many people do anymore. They <laughs> just do. Even, they don't even watch the game. Minute. They watch. They watch the highlights on Twitter or YouTube. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Three minute YouTube session. That's all you need, and we can have a conversation about it. The conversation and the social and the online 
is almost better than the actual game itself. We haven't started yet on this Interest game. in the we transfer really market, have. Clive. It's bigger than interest in the game, and I think this is the point. Tim, we're complicit. You know, you want Werner and Havertz and and mm-hmm. um, Aubameyang and, and Salah and Mane, and, you know, you go on and on down the line. I can't think of any good players at... at United right now, but I'm sure there, there, might, there might be one. Maybe Paul Pogba. Would you want those players at these clubs. You want these beautiful pitches and these big stadiums, and you don't want it to be, you know, a potato patch and head tennis at the center line, you know, and two-footed tackles. Well, that's because of the money, and that's because of the way the game has mm. changed. And I don't think people are, you know, begging for it to go back to the way it was. Now, to be fair, there are some people that would prefer that it goes back to the way it was, but I don't think it will. I mean, the thing that's hard here, Tim, is realistically – the Premier League has absolutely no relationship from a business standpoint and sporting standpoint with the leagues below it. It just doesn't. Mm-hmm. And this relegation yep. promotion thing is a filament that binds them together, a little connection to the tradition of the, of the old pyramid. But it is it is a falsehood because they are not the same. Mm-hmm. 99.9% of global fans don't even know that the second division of English football is called the championship, and they couldn't name you teams that are in it. And I think the domestic fans are increasingly being cut off from that, and you can disagree with me if you like and tell me that I'm wrong. Maybe I am. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the American owners quite clearly, what they want, they want the NFL, right? They want a league that mints money, that you don't have to lose money to run your club, that your clubs increase in both value as an asset and in profitability. I mean, NFL teams not only are worth billions and billions of dollars, but they make billions of dollars a year, right? So the league makes Mm. money and the assets appreciate. And there's no question in my mind that the American owners look at the Premier League and say, if we can cut some of these old filaments and and break away from some of these traditions, we can create that business model here. Now, I'm not saying that's best for fans or best for football. I'm saying that's what they want. And Mm. I am not by any means saying it's the right thing. But I think the irony is when we say it's just self-interest from the big clubs, in a way, I think it's the big clubs being patronizing almost to say, like, we know what's best for all of us, right? Like yep. like Everton and Southampton and Wolves, we know what's best for you. And what's best for you is breaking away from this old system and getting to a situation where you don't have to throw money in a well to compete. Um, you know, and I think that's long-term where they'd like it to go. Or alternatively, it's just a precursor to a European Super League. Because let's be honest, if you're trying to negotiate the next big TV contract, does an NBC in the U.S. or a Sky in, in England or you know whoever it is around the world, do they want Arsenal Burnley twice a year and Chelsea versus Crystal Palace twice a year? Or do they want Arsenal Madrid, Barcelona Liverpool, Chelsea Bayern Munich, you know, every single week, Juventus versus PSG every single week? That's... That's easier to sell. So, you know, I think all of this is bound up together. I guess the last question I'd ask you about this is simply, is it an inevitability? Is is the money in football and the business model in football and the need to negotiate ever-increasing TV contracts and the, the challenge of converting to digital pennies from analog dollars and all of these things that are going on, are they ultimately incompatible with maintaining a pyramid in England for football that is all connected and, and bound up in this tradition? And do you think... If it is inevitable that these traditions change, will will the sport thrive and, and survive going forward? Will fans accept that? Is there ever a scenario where those traditions can change? How do you how do you see this long term playing out? And, and before I turn it over to you, I want to be clear: I am identifying the issues that I think are causing these rifts and causing these changes to need to be made. I think some mm-hmm. of them may be suicide for football. I, I really do because there's something about the emotion and the passion and the hope and the story we tell ourselves about football that is unique and draws global fans to it, and local fans alike. So I do worry that the soul of football, which is unique, could be ripped out of it and destroy the game. But it's harder to quantify what that means. So do you have a thought about where the, where this goes and if it if it leads yeah. to greater success or failure? So I, I, I don't think the idea... I, I think the idea of the pyramid as it is is unsustainable. I don't think the idea of the pyramid is unsustainable. I think it needs... It needs looking at and ultimately there is no perfect answer so yes you can do wage caps but then you know you potentially create a situation where you've got wage caps and then a team does get promoted into the premier league and there's this massive differential and teams just (laughs) end up like killing themselves you know doubling everyone's contracts when they get into the premier league and things like that um i do think the pyramid as it is is not compatible with um the, the desires of the majority of Premier League owners. And I, and I say that this part 
completely non-judgmentally if you put a lot of american owners together you'll get an american sport yeah. um yeah, or at least it. you'll get <laughs> an americanized sport like i don't believe that um you know that uh, fsg and kse and 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 even before that guys who bailed like randy lerner i don't think they came into this thinking yeah i'm i'm buying into the english pyramid here i think they came into this thinking there's an opportunity um, here to turn this into into something else even more profitable and and i think i think what's really coming down the track is um the uh, and you you i think hinted at the idea there is is about promotion and relegation and i think that that's the thing that wasn't i think that was probably still considered too unpalatable um to really air but and and again you referenced it there the bargaining chip that that the big six or whatever you want to call them will always, always have is the super league. Right. And, and what they will say, and I think this is where it will go with the idea of promotion and relegation. They'll say to the premier league, if you don't um, guarantee us that we can stay in the top flight, we'll just go to the super league because there's no relegation there. And this is, this has already happened a couple of times, um, you know, using the threat of the super league to get some concessions. It's been done to UEFA. It's been done to the premier league um, and, and definitely um, international broadcasting rights because international broadcasting rights, when the whole premier league was created, um, which is, you know, a massive sea change in English football anyway, um, they didn't anticipate that international broadcast rights would even be a thing, let alone that they would be worth more um, than than domestic broadcast rights. And so you've got this real tension between and on the face of it, from a purely business perspective, you can completely understand why Liverpool, and Manchester United and Arsenal would say, well, hang on. How come Burnley are getting the same um, from international broadcasting rights that, that we're getting. We're the ones that are generating that interest. But obviously, um, in terms of the bigger picture, one of the selling points of the Premier League is the idea of competitiveness. And if you take that away, then, you know, do you lose a bit of the interest in the product? And this is, this is again, where I don't really have an answer because I'm actually not that convinced that the competitiveness of the Premier League is a big selling point to a lot of people. Um, first of all, because it's becoming less competitive and it's becoming more popular. But also, like I look at what like um, Barcelona and, and Real Madrid do um, with with their kind of with their actual what they do with their stadiums where Barcelona sell tickets to their members cheap as chips. But what, where they rack the prices up are for um, overseas visitors who want to go and see like Messi. Mm. And so you can buy a package from London or Rome or Paris and you buy this package where you go to Barcelona for a weekend, beautiful city, come and watch Barcelona. And those people don't want to watch Villarreal um, or Real Zaragoza or Betis grind out a nil-nil. They want Barcelona to win 6-0 and Messi to score four goals. That's what they've come to see. Um, and I actually, I don't think, I think it's becoming so tribal now that that competitiveness is not a selling point. So actually, I, I and, and I think maybe some of these bigger owners see this. I think Manchester United will think, well, yeah, if we wallop Burnley 4-0 every week, people aren't going to turn off because people support Manchester United. That's that's what they want to see. So there is this kind of, I guess, battle for the soul um, of football. And what I'm seeing is increased inequality and increased interest happening at the same time. So I'm personal, I, you know, I haven't exactly done any market research here, but I'm not, I'm not convinced. I value competitiveness probably over everything, um, but I, I'm, you know, not convinced that well, I'm I'm pretty sure that I don't represent the the majority of people and what they want. So, I you know I think there are a lot of things that are coming down the track on this, and I think one of the, the unifying lessons I've learned in life, Elliot, is that the billionaires always get what they want in mm -hmm. the end, in yep. some form or other. They will get whether they manage to just get more concessions, whether they just get an increasing part of the domestic. Because what will happen is they will keep getting i think they will keep negotiating increased you know for an increased slice of the overseas pie and if they don't get it they'll just say okay we'll set up a super league and that will always be the tension point that will always be the ace up their sleeve so i i think there are um there are a lot of things that are that are kind of 
that are, that are coming um, and they will get them one way or another. But but one thing I will say, I guess, is that I, I spoke to someone a few years ago who'd worked with the Premier League on overseas broadcasting rights. And of course, one of the things that in 2008 was put out there was the, the idea of the 39th game and uh, having the game overseas. And, and uh, I, I spoke with a guy who worked with the Premier League on this proposal and he said, and there was a lot of particularly domestic opposition to it. You know, the idea that you, because it creates inequality in the league and, you know, the, the idea that for the tradition of the game, that like one of the league games takes place in Singapore or Malaysia or China or, or whatever was unpalatable to people. What he told me, it wasn't the domestic opposition, like we might think, that shot that down. He said the reason the 39th game didn't happen is because actually the people in Malaysia and China and Singapore didn't want it. Mm. They regarded the, you know, the local color as part of the experience and they didn't want it transplanted yep. um, in, into their territories because they, they thought, well, it's not the same product if you put it there. Um, and, and that was the thing that killed it. So, you know, maybe there's, you know, maybe there. There is something that's not worth selling, I guess, for for even some of these big clubs that might even turn out to be a turnoff um, for, th- for the overseas dollar. I think that's right. I think one thing, though, that has been bad for the people that fight to maintain the soul of the game is that we were always told the Premier League's filled stadiums are a big part of the draw and why it mm-hmm. works on TV, and I will agree. Project Restart Football isn't as exciting as football with the fans in the stands, but... The viewing numbers are still good. Now, to be fair, you can say this because there's nothing else to watch. There's nothing else going on. But, like, I I think we're seeing that digitally they can create an experience that people will still watch. So even that aspect of it, yeah. you know, maybe has changed. And look, let's be honest. This is all driven by naked greed. But it's kind of like Red Riding Hood complaining that the wolf eats her. What yeah. do you think these Americans were buying these clubs for? Altruism? <laughs> frog in the so, school. Yeah. Enter, 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 exactly could, their love going. of the game? Well, and, 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 All you got to do is look yeah. at human behavior. Like, yeah. This is a. Do you think people are going to give money away for free? Do you think they're going to sit there and watch hundreds of millions of pounds not go into their pockets because there's no fans in the ground and not react? I mean, these people are billionaires for a reason. They're quite good in money and they're quite good at seeking, seeing opportunities. And they have no ethics. <laughs> and so basically, they don't care. <laughs> as, I, as I said earlier, this game hasn't even started to reach its potential yet. Yes, and I think that's a very good point you said about. Premier League dragging the other leagues behind them with a tenuous link. I hadn't thought of it that way around, but human behavior says, I'm going to give you lots of money to do certain things, and one day I'm going to ask for it back. And how am I going to do that? And how can I facilitate that decision process? And this is all around the voting rights, because then I can control what we do with these assets that we've built up globally. I can control what they do, how they're used, how they're operated, and how they can start putting money back into my pocket over a period of years. And so this is it. (laughs) Remember Tim? Do you remember Tim being in Cardiff, 2005, when Paul Scholes went up to take that penalty in the the shootout? And we're all shouting USA laughing at them. Remember that one? (laughs) And then they missed the pen, and then we went on one, and Vieira did his last kick (laughs) off. And here we are later now, a few years later in the global game. How many US owners do we have in the top league? The game has changed. We never thought it would happen to us, and it has. The game has changed, and these guys are not they are not free lunches. we got a Thomas Pye. They, they want payback, right? They want payback, and it's going to come. It's just how it comes. We better get ready for it. And, and you know, Clive, I mean, the problem is t- Tim referenced – you know, Manchester United beating Burnley and, and not wanting competitiveness. I think the bigger issue is when Burnley plays Crystal Palace and the owners of the big clubs look at the broadcast money that's going to Burnley and going to Crystal Palace and they look at the viewing figures for a game like that and they say, already doing I'm, it, mate. I'm not having it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they're already doing yeah. it. Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's what's driving this is they recognize that, that there are, you take, pick a number. Let's say there are six watchable clubs beyond England. And by watchable, again, these clubs are important. They have a tradition. Their fans love them. But I'm saying for this global market that they're competing for all these ever-increasing um, uh, broadcast contracts, when you have games between the bottom 14, you have seven games a week that just aren't pulling in any viewing figures at all. There's a reason when Peacock launched the broadcast streaming service, uh, NBC's paid streaming service in the U.S., the, suddenly Arsenal showed up behind the paywall, but you could watch Palace Burnley on free-to-air TV. 
And the reason is they know what's going to drive people to sign up for those that streaming service. So there's a lot of, I think the point is there's a lot of competing interests here. And from a purely business perspective, I don't see how you can bring these billionaire American capitalists into your league, have them look at this pyramid and think, yes, we want to continue to prop this up. My fear is that one way or another, they will get what they want. And I think what they want is a closed league. I think they want the championship to be the top of the pyramid and the premier league to be its own closed circuit thing. Absent that they want a European super league. And I, I I think it's going to be pick your poison in England, either a breakaway super league or a closed premier league. And again, I'm not outlining these things because I want them to happen. I worry that the soul of the game goes that it'll be fun for a year or two, but something about the way the fans interact with the clubs and the hatred and the tension and the passion will be different. And, and it just won't hold our interest. It will it will start to just be too much of a, a soap opera, this transfer stuff and who won the transfer window. And it won't, you know, it, it won't. maybe not. It won't, I mean, maybe that's really naive. Just I don't dying. know. You know? So I, when, we, we, when we had our bar conversation, those words you used, soul of the game, that was what I said. We're going to lose the soul of the game. I don't say it anymore because the soul of the game is up for grabs. It's up for grabs. Right? We can see that now, can't we? It's all up for grabs. Everything. Does it always work though, Clive? Like, do you care about Nations League? Like, for example, I love the World Cup. You couldn't pay me to watch the Nations Nations League. League. At some point, this stuff just stops working, you know? Yeah, I don't care about Nations League, but I still watch England game this week, you know, because that's that's what I do, right? And and they know they've got a captive audience. Well, you know, I'm not sure we're going to talk about it, but the 15 quid for. uh, Let's get on to it. Sure, why not? Watching uh, watching, uh, uh, an Arsenal game. I can huff and puff and I can say this, I can say that, but you know what? <laughs> Where do I sign? Where do I click? Because I'm 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 an Arsenal fan, right? And I want to see the games, I want to see them properly. It's gonna be hard for me not to pay you that money, you know, because that's the way I'm wired, that's the way I'm built. Not everyone's built that way, but it's just indicative of ways of getting money back into the clubs and I can't moan because because we sat here doing podcasts in a while and party. How do you think that's gonna get paid for? Do you see what I mean? We want both those players. Well, we can we recruit advertisers. Oh, you mean not our podcast? The, the, the actual <laughs> How do those players get paid for? So we we feed this, we feed this, we feed this, and this is who we are, right? And um, my 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 issue is, I I think some of the people at the top of the game are not very smart. They're not very smart. They think they're smart, but they're not very smart, and they need to get smart because if they don't get smart, they will going to get they're going to get governed. And that's the that's the worry. That's the worst. The people, <laughs> that's the that's worst. Because <laughs> those people, people aren't smart think, either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and people need to think carefully. I mean, let's I'll give you a small little discussion. And, and I, I heard a part of this somewhere. I'll just give my view. And then we talk about the five substitution rule. You know, I was all for that. Yeah, I said that's a great idea. And the other some of the people in the Premier League went against it, and the Premier League didn't do it. And I'm thinking, well. Okay, you're fighting off the the big six clubs, but it's their t- it's their players that are playing for England three times in seven days in in the Nations League. It's not your Burnley players that are doing that. Does well, that I'm mean? having to go plant the flag for England in the in the Champions League and the Europa League. You know, well, what, what, what I'm that. saying to you, what I'm saying to you is they are stopping. They are keep chipping away at these at these boys. Sometimes you got to say, you know what, you can have that one. Even we can't give it the old. We haven't got the same squads as you. You can have that one. If you don't, if you don't let us have that one, we're gonna we're gonna chop your legs off. You see what I mean? You need to get smart. You need to think bigger. You need to fight the right battles. You know, you need to fight the right battles. I think some of the people, they don't, because of that word that Tim alluded to earlier on, self-interest rules, and bigger picture. They are not thinking bigger picture. They are thinking this season, how can I stay in this league? How can I get this cash? And the billionaires are thinking, I want my cash. And the billionaires will win in the end. It reminds me of a chess game that you've already lost. And you're just moving your king around the board. And at some point, you might as well just tip your king over because you've already lost. And I think some of these smaller clubs, you know, pushing back on the five subs rules and pushing back on it. Like, all you're doing is moving your king around the board. You've already lost. So to your point about big picture, someone better come up with a plan that makes the most sense for the most people. Otherwise, what will happen is the bullies will push everyone around and make the plan that makes the most sense for them. This is the time for negotiating a plan that makes sense for everybody long-term. I I think COVID has accelerated something that was going to happen anyway. Um, you know, And one of the things that the big six clubs want to be able to do is sell rights to their games directly, a few of their games directly to their fans. I can understand why the smaller clubs don't want them to do that, but it, you have to be able to test that model because eventually analog TV is going away and everything's going to go digital. And right now you're just pushing people to illegal streams. You know what we found with Napster 
Everyone thought, oh, no one's going to pay for iTunes. No one's going to pay for music. No one's going to pay for Spotify. And they, well, they did because they got the price right and the service was good. And a really good service at the right price is something people will pay for. So, Clive, I mean, you referenced $15 for a game. It's mm-hmm. highway robbery. It's insanity. Mm-hmm. It's the, the dumbest freaking thing I've ever heard in my life. But the only really dumb thing about it to me is pricing. Is this just an elasticity of demand issue? Because to me, at $15, people are still going to go to their illegal streams. But th- there is a price where this makes a lot of sense for a lot of people, isn't there? Yeah. A fiver would have done it. And, um, and that would have done a lot. I think I could have boosted the coffers really because they go to illegal stream. They're not always that easy to get, right? And when you when you go in there, you'll <laughs> just get up, you'll give me a shout, my man. I'll hook you. Up. Just kidding. <laughs> I don't know anything about them. Go, never go, seen go, one. Never go. heard of one. They're certainly not posted in the Discord every weekend, so I don't know what you're <laughs> talking about. <laughs> yeah, so they're not that easy to get. So anyway, maybe they are easy. Right? So um, people are now going to flood me in messages. <laughs> so, you're going to um, get all the spammed free HD 4K stream here. <laughs> you're going to get spammed all this. But you know, jo- joking aside, I think. A lot of this, this is where you guys in the in the US, and I say that because we have lots of US listeners, but you know, you have the concept of big market, small market. You know, I love, I love um, LeBron, yeah. as you know, and Anthony Davis came from a small market team. He was playing really, really well. The Pelicans, New Orleans Pelicans, small market team, comes to Lakers, plays very similarly, now a global superstar. This concept of big market, small market, and how that works in the US world, I think we, if you want to see what's going to happen to our league, we need to start looking around at the NBA and NFL and, and see how they manage these markets, see how they manage transfers, see how they manage trades, see how they, you know, drafts. Let's just, it's, it's, it's all on the table, mate. It's all on the table. And I think if you want to know what could happen, for those who are not interested in U.S. sports, start looking at the NFL, start looking at the NBA, start looking at how they move players Transfer fees, are they going to disappear? Contracts, guaranteed contracts, not guaranteed contracts. This is what I try to learn and read at the moment, just because I like it, but I like it, not think it's going to happen to Arsenal Football Club, but it will, it could well do. And so we need to look around what's happening as fans, because one day someone might actually ask us what we think. Right? Mm-hmm. So get get educated. Be a huge mistake. Let's see what could happen. <laughs> no, and, um, don't you ask me. And then, and then <laughs> get ready for those conversations, those people who are involved in fan groups, for example. Get educated. Look at US sports. Look at what could happen. Get ahead of the game. Get ahead of the game if you want things to stay the same or start thinking more broadly about what needs to happen. Let's get realistic and try to move the game forward as a collective or there will not be a collective. Yeah, look, change is very, very scary. And I find myself looking at it that way too. I mean, I I didn't want to go to five subs just because it was change and change is scary. But like, if you resist needed change, you wind up with something worse, uh, which is atrophy, decay, decomposition, um, all the things happening to my body, basically, as I age. Um, So, Tim, last quick word on on the selling the rights to the games directly to the fans. I mean... It seems pretty straightforward to me, right? It's just pricing. If you get the price right, people will do yeah. it. And if not, it's an outrage. And I mean, maybe this is one of those cases where they say it's fifteen dollars, everyone gets outraged, everyone throws their toys out of the yeah, pram, yeah. they come back, Oh, sorry, we were wrong. What we mean is four pounds ninety nine and they say, Oh yay, we won. Whereas if they had just said four pounds ninety nine initially, everyone would have said that was too expensive. So is that is that really it? We're just we're all just sheep and we yeah. don't even notice it. Yeah, I, I think there's a big element of that. So I, I'm sure they know. Like football, like English football has been down the pay per view r- uh, route before. Um, it didn't work. So they're, they're not stupid, um, these people. They understand. Because the thing is, right, um, if they'd priced it at a tenner, I think a lot of people would say that's unreasonable. Like, no, fiver. But now if they go back down to a tenner, everyone will say, oh, yeah, 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 that's all right, actually. Um, and again, like from a purely business point of view I, I see it like so this 15 pounds right apparently it's not going to the premier league it's not even going to the broadcast it's going to the clubs and clubs have big black holes in their revenues at the moment arsenal are charging like 50 quid for you to go and watch the man city game at the emirates in club level and you know have this beer and a pizza sense. i feel like i'm taking and, crazy yeah, pills and, you can't go to the game because it's not allowed but you can pay 50 pounds and go to the stadium and watch the game at the club level like doesn't yeah, make any yeah. sense and <laughs> I, I get it in club level because it's easily easy to socially distance and stuff like that. And 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 me and Debs are talking about my wife. Sorry, we're talking about that as well. And we were like, if that was thirty quid, I might be a bit more te- like beer and a pizza. That you know that that doesn't make up to fifty quid. But you know the, the, these guys, they're looking at big holes in their revenues and they're looking to fill them. Um, and and look, I I completely understand. They have effectively been giving away a lot of the games kind of for free. 
um, in the last few months. And so that, that always hurts. And I can understand the clubs um, look at looking to make some of these revenues up. But stuff like, um, you know, Prem Flicks or whatever, um, th- again, that's coming. They've got to work out how to do it. It's not straightforward. The current, um, you know, model for selling rights has suited the Premier League down to the ground because they don't have to do anything. They sell it and they go, right, you sort it out. We don't have to become a mini production company just give us money and do what you want that and that that's all that's been very very successful for them um you know you change the kickoff times you employ the cameramen and all of that uh cameramen and women sorry you you know you employ the pundits like give us the money and just take it um whereas with something like a streaming or on demand service that would either have to turn the clubs or the premier league into content providers um, and, and they're probably going that way anyway. Like the Premier League website has content on it. They have match previews Tim, and things like that. The NFL has a network called the NFL yeah. Network, and they show one game a week. They have tons of NFL-related bro- programming, but they show yep. every single game replayed in the week following that match week. So, like, I'm sure the yep. Premier League wants its own network. It, it just makes yep. sense to, to control your content. Definitely. And you'll get, you know, more of this stuff like um, all or nothing, the all or nothing series that won't be on Amazon anymore. That 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 will go on Prem Flix or whatever. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll be able to fill content like clubs have experimented with with TV channels and things like that. You know, you you could have a Premier League TV channel easily. Well, I say easily. I'm not sure it's easy, but it's doable and I'm sure it's coming. But it just takes a little bit of it's going to take a little bit of repositioning, a little bit of jockeying. But it's it's all coming down the line. Um, you know, as for the 15 quid, I mean, from my perspective, look, let's cut to the chase. I'm paying that for Arsenal Leicester. Um, I don't think I should have to. I'm a season ticket holder. That's a home game. I should get it for free. I'm, I'm going to pay for it. There is absolutely no way I will pay 15 quid to watch any other team. Um, but like I said, like it's all it's all becoming very tribalized. I'm not sure how much people want to watch, you know, other than the biggest games, which will not be on pay-per-view anyway, I'm not sure how much of a clamour there will be for other games anyway. So again, this is this is this is like a good chance for them to experiment, and I'm pretty certain they've thought, mm, let's have it at 15 quid. We'll take some kickback. We'll go down to 10. We'll look like the good guys. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, people love football, and they just want to watch their club and root for their club and support their club, or in my case, obviously the opposite. Um, you know, and, and they just want to enjoy it. And, and all of these business conversations, I get that they can be analytically interesting, but they're extremely tedious. And I think the reason I hate them is if I felt that there were smart, competent, good stewards of football in charge of the premier league, in charge of the clubs, in charge of the future of football, I wouldn't even particularly care about this conversation, Tim, because like, I just know it was going somewhere good that I'll enjoy and I'll sit back and watch it. What scares me is I don't know that I trust these people. <laughs> Clive said he's not yeah. sure there are smart people in charge. I got to agree. Now, I think there's some smart people. And this is the funny thing, right? I think some of the people in charge of the clubs are smart, but they are yeah. obviously singularly self-interested, as you'd expect. I think the people in charge of the league are not smart. And that's good. Yeah. Me. And and this is where, um, for me, and I know a lot of people are going to disagree with this, and I'm sorry. This is, for me, where VAR, and Clive mentioned it, is a big thing because I think football has done brilliantly in the last 25, 30 years during this explosion um, of interest, out, out, outlawing the back, part, you know, the back pass rule. Brilliant, brilliant innovation that immediately improved the entertainment. Um, outlawing the tackle from behind. Brilliant. Now you don't have, like... You know, Messi doesn't have to retire at 28 with bullet holes in his knees. Brilliant. Reward the skillful players. VAR is the first time we have made a big change to the game that is not universally appreciated and which I think is a, has come from the wrong place. Um, and I won't say any more than but, that. But what I will say, it's... okay, so so I sort of agree with you, Tim, but this is why I don't trust the Premier League to do anything right. Yeah, exactly, I think VAR's exactly. implementation could have been such that it was much more <sighs> uh, transparent, that we don't feel yeah, yeah. it as much, that it achieves what it needs to achieve in a way that is a little more seamless and a little more uniform in, in its application. Yep. Like, again, no, I, I think, I, you were I never going to like VAR, Tim, but I think what I'm saying no, exactly. is that how poorly they implemented it is a bad indication of their ability to change with the times. Clive, it sounds like you want to get in there and then I want to talk, Please. touch on some Arsenal stuff before we get out of here. Cause there's, there is still yeah, uh, plenty drifting, of meat on that. We're bone. drifting a bit, but it's good stuff. Right. When Tim says 
is coming from the wrong place. I wonder if he's thinking what I'm thinking. I think a lot of VAR was very much technology and TV company driven. Mm. They've kept forcing it by highlighting errors of referees massively, making big issues, creating storms and narratives around referee decisions, and which made people think, well, you know, we've we got to bring in technology. But they didn't really think about how they're going to bring that in, as we alluded to just then. And I think it was always a danger. You had to be more piecemeal for me. You had to protect the game itself and the conversation, what the game is. Think about things a little bit more rather than bring it in the blanket way and use words like, um, you know, key words like just to make sure decisions were done correctly, you know, um, clear and obvious. Well, what the hell does that mean? Well, just put clear and obvious around it and then we can do what we like under that protective state umbrella. That's rubbish. And so really we have a discussion now about VAR. I'm going to talk about the game. And when VAR is not there, when the decision goes wrong, we're asking for VAR. So the soul of the game has gone. It's gone. It's been changed. It's been, it's been changed forever. We have to adapt to that. We all have to adapt to the fact that life and the world has changed and it is not going to happen. It's not going to stay the same. The Rubinho effect, <laughs> Rubinho, it, it changed at Man City. If Man City can be the club they are today, then everything's up for grabs. Mm. And so that's how I feel, mate, my friend. And, and I mean, if you, you know, if you don't adapt, I think you make it easier to manipulate the system and easier to destroy it. I think if you do adapt, you can build a structure that is more durable long term in the face of the new reality of what football is. And we will see if they are able to achieve that or if they'll just keep putting bullet holes in their feet. Um, so, d- Tim. There's a couple of, of Arsenal issues, actually. Uh, we have a game at the weekend, a pretty big one against Manchester City. No Kevin De Bruyne, maybe no Kieran Tierney, but there will be no William Saliba, I think it is fair to say, although he is eligible. What he is not eligible for is the Europa League. Um, I'm confused by this, and and we don't know why William Saliba is not playing. We don't know if his, his mother passing tragically and, and his sort of emotional state is making it that he's not particularly ready to contribute. Uh, we don't know if his level isn't quite there. But what I am fairly confident in saying is that if we're not going to loan him out, and if he is going to be at Arsenal at least until January, the level that he would probably be most comfortable playing at would be Europa League. And certainly if we wrap up the group early, and I'm not saying that's a given, but if we did, there might be one or two even dead rubber Europa League uh, fixtures that he could start in with, with absolutely no pressure. So I struggle if we're not loaning him prior to January, which we're not. I, I struggle to understand why he wouldn't be registered in that particular competition. Do you have a, a good answer for that? Or or do you want to just make up an answer and then I can tell you if it's good? So basically, so something's happened that we don't know about, right? This 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 can't be about fitness in terms of... And I completely understand everything Arteta said about we have to protect him because he was injured a lot last season. But I don't think that's what's going on here. He was going to play in the French Cup final against Neymar and Mbappe. Um, at the end of July, you, you don't go from that to he's so unfit we can't use him until January. Like that doesn't that doesn't tally. Like when he missed the first couple of squads of the season, I just thought, well, yeah, okay, that's that's kind of fine. They're looking after him, but you know, you go from that. They, you know, Fulham came in on the last day um, to try and loan him, and then we were told that San Etienne wanted to loan him back, and that was a, a deal the club were willing to do, but they couldn't get it done in time. So that tells you that they were willing to send him back out on loan, whether that's till January or, or the end of next season. So so something has happened and all of that seemed to happen quite late in the day. So whether this is just a gradual thing, a gradual realisation in training that, you know, whether it's physically or mentally, um, that he's he's not quite there at the moment. It's, it's a big decision. Like it's one thing to do perhaps what Klopp has done with a few players, like he did with Robertson and Fabinho, where he made the decision that, okay, they're, they're not quite ready for the Premier League yet, but he waited until like October to really blood them. And then they came in. But the fact that Arsenal were willing to send him out on loan suggests this is like a, a, a medium term issue, um, should we say. Might even be a long term issue for all we know at the moment. Um, and look, we can only speculate on the reasons, whether that's, you know, because of um, personal circumstances that have happened. I, I think one of the things I, I'm learning as well at the moment is that, and I think um, Andrew wrote about that this morning, Friday morning on Ask Blog about how good Arteta is at not answering questions mm. if he doesn't want yeah. to. If Arteta doesn't want something out there, it doesn't tend to go out there. And I, I think one of the ways you can tell he's really respected at this club is that 
there's not a lot of leaking goes on. Even with the Ozil situation, we don't really know what's happening. And there must be plenty of people who are dying to leak that. And when he first fell out with Emery, we knew we knew everything that had happened within like 48 hours. Um, whereas I think Arteta runs a much tighter ship. So we might never, or at least we might not presently find out exactly what's happening. But it, stri- it strikes me that something, whether it's a flashpoint or an incident or a gradual realisation, something has happened that we don't know about. Um, and that we can only really speculate on, and maybe there are there are areas where we shouldn't speculate, um, you know, around like personal circumstances and things like of that. Course, but yeah, mental but health yes, kind of this, thing. yeah, yeah. But the, but you, this is odd. This is odd. We signed a player over a year ago now, and sending him back on loan for one year, I think, made total sense. And from what I can gather, the deal wouldn't have been done had we not agreed to it. And then you've got this fallout with St. Etienne about the cup final. And then a few weeks later, we're trying to loan him back there, like scrabble it. Like it, it, it's the, there's there's some missing information there, shall we say. And we probably won't find out, um, you know, in, until in, in the fullness of time. And, you know, we we're discussing this off mic, like with Rob Holding. Rob Holding was basically halfway into a Newcastle shirt and that was called off. I thought at the time that was tied to the David Luiz injury because mm-hmm. we were told David Luiz might be out for six to eight weeks. But I still thought that was strange at the time because I thought, okay, it's not a long-term injury. You don't not send someone on loan for a whole season because of, you know, a four to six week injury, which it proved not to be, particularly when we've got about a million centre halves. So what's gone on there? But I think what we can probably say with, um, with some uh, emphasis now is that that was tied more to Saliba um than it than it was to david louise so there's there's some missing information um there basically and 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 i guess we'll we'll find out in the fullness of time because i don't believe that arsenal bought this player thinking that they wouldn't use him for two years put it that way no certainly not and and i mean his level in league on was sufficient to think that he could step in and participate step in and dominate no teenage center backs don't play in the premier league but he was playing at a high level in france he was highly regarded there There's no way he went from highly regarded in France to not good enough to compete at the Europa League level. Now, to me, Clive, not including him in the Europa League squad is Arteta taking a burden off himself, in a way, because something is happening here where Arteta knows, I'm not going to use this player, full stop, period. If I register him for Europa League, there will be questions every time he's not in a team. There'll be questions every time he doesn't get on the pitch. I will be under pressure to put him in that team since he's not playing in the Premier League. But if I don't register him for Europa League, I deal with that question one time at the beginning and then never again for the Europa League group stage. So I, I think you'd have to say that one reason for not registering him is to rip the Band-Aid off. Have people ask why he wasn't registered. It it happens around the time of a huge transfer coming in. So, you, you know, the question kind of gets buried and then you don't deal with it again. Whereas, you know, again, if he's in the team... Or, or, or registered every time he doesn't play, people are going to be asking why. So what, what I would ask you, Clive, about Saliba is simply this. There's obviously something that we don't know about, and as Tim said, probably won't know about. Um, how do you summarize right now where you think we stand with this move in terms of long-term, you still feel totally fine about it, long-term, you have some concerns about it, we may actually see him in the Premier League. He'll wind up going out in January. Like, wh- Look into your crystal ball yeah. for me and tell me wh- where you stand with this player in this move right now. Because when we signed him a year plus ago, I think people thought, we've, you know, we've got the future guy and what a savvy move that was. And obviously, it's taken a turn. Okay, right. Let's give it a go, shall we? Yeah, fire away. So... Uh... Yeah, like I said, like I said before, and like, I think there's been a couple of events that have happened that we don't know about. The Rob Holding one looked at some Newcastle sites, and they'd literally got him a house, so he was ready to go, and he suddenly went. I thought mm, that's interesting. I immediately linked that to Saliba, uh, more so than Louise, and he didn't get in the Europa League squad. It'd be interesting to see he's in the Premier League squad. Um, I think I hope he is. I, I, I do. I just think there's been. Event and one event that maybe we've not realised is that Arteta didn't sign this player. He was signed by the club. Well, I mean, we know that so, because it, you know it was arguably before Arteta really would have had any ability to influence that decision, right? So he may not like him. Well, but it's how could he football. even know? Could he even know yet? I mean, he's eighteen. I, just I don't know. He trains every day in football. Mm. I mean, I don't know. He's like, um, 
And sometimes we just forget that. Sometimes we think, oh, we like him. We've YouTubed him to death. And and I spoke to James offline. And he went to see him in France as part of his role for the athletic. And he's absolutely convinced by his quality. And Julian Laurent speaks about him as a potential Arsenal future captain. There's a lot of people that think a lot about him. So I think, you know, based on my YouTube skills, I'm pretty convinced. Um, look at his statistics. All we can say is he hasn't played a lot of football. And that's all we can say. He's growing significantly. He's a six foot four guy. Maybe needs to solidify into his body a little bit more. This is a time where you maybe don't overplay people because of the rapid growth they have around 16 years of age onwards. This is a time you just leave them, solidify them. When they pick up and do death, them saying that my body's not quite there yet to take the robustness of top level football. It's an indicator. Breathe. Don't play. Don't play him. Just let him come back slowly but surely but space his games out and make sure his body can settle down because his body is his trade and if we often find a lot of players of that sort of size they have significant back injuries because they 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 train sorry they grow very very quickly to a high height and you get stress factors at the back you get stress injuries of lower limbs these are the things that i'm sure they're looking at to make sure that we have the player that we need for five to ten years potentially that's how i'm looking at it I don't think it's a talent issue. It may be a physical level issue just as his body's adapting and there's other things going on in the background which we can't speculate about. I'm trying to think this through in all different angles. I can't fully explain it, but from a football point of view, I look at the player and think the way he moves, the way he tackles, the way he drives, the way he passes, everything's there. So it must be the extra extra source of circumstances around the player, around his growth, around his development, around his injuries, around the language, the new country, the personal circumstances. I want to believe it's all of those things. And they some of those will fade over time. And I'm hoping it's in a Premier League squad and then we can say, okay, we now have a player that we can potentially see and use because he sits there, you know, he's he's got what we need in the right centre half perspective, purely on paper. However, we do have other people that have not gone out the door. There is no rush. We've got Mustafi sitting there ready to come back now as a full train before the break. He'll be very close. So Arsenal don't need to rush this despite our excitement and expectation. There is no rush. We've got Louise who can play right centre half. We've got Holden can play right centre half. We've got Gabrielle can play left centre half. We've got Mary can play left centre half. Arsenal don't need to rush this to suit us, to break a player. Right, so they can take their time. These players are hanging around. Some of them who want to go, they're not going. They're hanging around. So why not use them while they're here to make sure we have the right type of player and the right sort of physical shape under no pressure to make an impact. And when he makes an impact, I'm hoping that we'll all like what we see. Yeah, let let me be clear about something too. Like, I think it is entirely possible that all of this is very closely related to the trauma that this player has suffered emotionally. That a teenage man losing his mother is a tragedy. Uh, Thankfully, it's not something I've been through. And for those of you listening who have experienced anything like it, I sincerely apologize and and can only uh, send every ounce of empathy that I have for you uh, for having gone through that because it, it just must be the most terrible thing in the world. And then to leave your home country, to speak a different language, to go to a bigger club and the pressure of that bigger club at such a young age, after such a major trauma. I, I mean, who would thrive? Who would? Very, very few people, maybe no one. And so I hate to speculate about emotional things and, and mental well-being, but this isn't like speculating about a disease or an illness. This is speculating about him hurting, and I don't think there's much speculation to that. He must be hurting, and it must be troubling. And I, I am prepared to set aside any footballing issues here to say that, that trauma and that experience at that age may just be more than the player can overcome and that the club may be trying to keep him out of the line of fire because it's what's best for him. And maybe he didn't get loaned domestically because it wouldn't have helped him in any of those ways. And a loan to St. Etienne may may have made a lot more sense, but maybe they just felt they couldn't loan him because he's not in a place where having to be under the bright lights and broadcast on television, playing football in his current state is, is viable for him. I, I don't know. There's a yep. lot of speculation that I don't want to get into, okay. but I could understand if that was the case. Clive, you want to come back on that? 
Just say one last thing, just to close that off. I mean, it's had to appoint Tim made earlier, and nothing's leaking out, and there's nothing's leaking out in France. And so that means it, it must be sensitive, right? So I'm prepared to, to leave it at that, you know what I mean? And trust my football judgment. If if, if you're not getting a sniff from, from France, you're not getting anything out of England, then you know what? There's some of the clubs looking after that boy, and that's all that matters. Yeah. Well said. Well, before we say goodbye, I just want to quickly ask you, Tim, you know, Arsene Wenger doing the rounds for his book tour, obviously, uh, we'll work hard on getting him on the podcast, and I'm, I'm certain that that will happen <laughs> because we are massive. Um, but And it's the only podcast he hasn't been on yeah, yeah. this week. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for the reminder. Um, yeah, so, so look, assuming that happens, we can ask him directly, but uh, until that happens, I don't want to put it on the back burner. There are a lot of things he's talking about that are interesting, and, and obviously, look, I love Arsene Wenger. If you don't love Arsene Wenger, that, that's up to you. I'm, I'm always going to love him and, and have an affection for him, but I don't know that he's helping Arteta with some of his Ozil comments. He's been pretty mm. supportive of Ozil with his comments, supportive of Ozil as someone who he believes will fight, someone who is too talented not to be playing, someone he thinks should be playing, and Arteta had to front up to those questions um, you know, in, in his pre-match press conference this week, uh, which obviously we will touch on the game as well because that's important. And Clive, stick around. I want to make sure you don't forget that. Um, but yeah, I, I just I just wonder without getting too much into the Ozil thing because it never goes anywhere good. Uh, do you do you have any thoughts on, on Ozil not being registered and Arson's comments and the pressure it puts on Arteta? Do you, do you have anything left to say on this topic that, that might be illuminating or has it all been said already? <laughs> no, once again, um, we don't know do we that's that that's that's the beginning and the end of it we don't there are only a few people who really really know what's going on and therefore it's kind of impossible to have um a a strong opinion on it i you know i like if he's not going to use like so we've clearly really gone down the road now where he's he's not usable and therefore if that's the case i support the decision uh not to have him in the squad if you know, if the club have come to a clear-headed decision, well, look, he's here, we've got to pay him, but we've completely moved on and we won't use him under any circumstances, fine, leave him out of the squad, shut that door, um, there'll be an intensity of questions, uh, you know, like you said about Saliba, it's kind of ripping the band-aid off because eventually those questions will stop, um, and that being the case, I kind of hope, not not out of any um, antipathy towards Ozil himself, I hope he's left out the Premier League squad as well. Otherwise, it would be really muddled thinking not to do both. And so it just shuts the door on it and it gives us all um, um, some clarity on it. Because, again, I don't think we're going to get the full clarity in in terms of what's actually happened. Um, And I tend to suspect that's because it's not a flashpoint or a single incident. It is probably a pattern of behavior which is harder um, you know, it's harder to release it. Like if it had been, you know, Ozil and Arteta had a massive fight. Um, they called each other dickheads or whatever. And that's that's where it's all come. Like a bit like Genduzi, right? There are a couple of flashpoints and we kind of know about them. With Ozil, I suspect it's much more a pattern of behavior. It's more likely to be, well, he's, you know, he's turning up and he's not just not training particularly hard. Um, and that leaves more, um, that just leads to more speculation and that leads to people who really, 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 really like Meza Ozil just saying, I don't believe that. Um, and people who really, really, really don't like him saying, no, that's definitely, you know, it, like it doesn't solve anything, um, basically. So I, I'm I'm happy for him not to be in the squad because um, it's the next best thing to him just not being at the club anymore, which, which I think would have been the absolute best case scenario for everybody, for him. Um, included, um, but yeah. So I, I'm I'm kind of happy for the subject to die a death, and short of the the player and the club coming to an agreement about ending his contract, which isn't going to happen from everything we're told. This is this is the next best thing, and I, I'm happy to personally move forward um, on that basis. And I think this is probably the best way of doing that. Yeah, I, I mean, whatever you think the right way to handle it is not registering him essentially ends the discussion. And the end of the yeah. discussion is a thing that we are all desperately ready for. He is 32. I am prepared to write off a 32-year-old footballer, but I can't because I think 80% of our squad is actually 32 right now. So I'm kidding. Um, no, we, we need 32-year-old footballers to still be good for a while. So that's not an, an argument in the defense. But before we move on to some final words about the City game, Clive, um, do you echo the sentiment just that like whatever 
contribution he could make, whatever the right way in Rockstar quotes to handle this would have been not registering him ends the conversation. And at this point, that's just what this club needs and you'll be happy yeah. for it. You know, you know, you know my thoughts, right? I will. <laughs> so you don't need to hear him again. Um, I, I'm, I'm ready to move on and have him for a long time unless he changes his behavior. I think Tim's lying there, but a pattern of behavior, I think that's spot on. And if you've got keen eyes, you can see, exactly what's going on around effort and things like that so i think that's very astute and we all know about the behaviors and non-negotiables in the current environment so we move on i think the venga stuff um has been quite interesting but not interesting that makes sense i think um listen to the guy he's always good in interviews he always comes up with some wisdom that makes you think he's a big thinker thinks about the horizon most interesting bit for me was Arteta's response when he said he's, he'd like him nearer the club because I often feel, well, we all know that he's probably hung around two years minimum too long and I think he's a, someone of that wisdom and someone of that experience, someone who's built his life in key working years around Arsenal Football Club and, and formed many of us in our thinking and how we think about the club and how we support the club and and many many people haven't known the club pre Wenger, you know. So um, I think that sort of person should be around our club in some sort of form. It's just how what that looks like now, and um, the fact that Arteta has embraced it tells you a lot about his quality and his confidence and his self assurance, because he's not afraid to have very good people around him, and we should be all buzzing about that, because that shows that. He knows he's good. He knows he's intelligent. He knows he's bringing the club forward. He knows he's well supported. And people around him are supporting him and the people up above him are behind him. So he's confident enough to say, I don't mind having a guy who's been in the club for 22 years, the greatest manager in the club's history, right next door. Didn't bother me. And that's just fantastic. That tells us a lot. So... That's an interesting thing I've seen this week. The rest is just Arsene Wenger being his normal Arsene Wenger self. Classy, doesn't dig anybody out, doesn't humiliate anybody, doesn't humiliate the club. Really interesting at the same time. Mm. I, I will say this. I mean, Mesut Ozil, <laughs> like the relationship between him and the club has reached comical points and the official account wishing him a happy birthday and him responding to thank you, Arsenal, yeah, Gunners, yeah, like... It reminds me of like the celebrities who are living in separate houses and haven't spoken in six months, but like they go on press junkets together and get photographed together. <laughs> like it's just you're not fooling anyone. And the irony is the happy birthday message, if you want to go look at it on Twitter from Arsenal to Ozil, it's a picture of Ozil. It's like a stock photo of a, a hostage. It's him wearing the shirt, arms crossed, looking miserable. <laughs> it's, it's just there is theater to this whole thing going on, and it's it's all a little bit ridiculous now, especially when you consider that he is our highest ever paid player. So uh Manchester City at the weekend, Clive. Saturday, football back, Manchester City, 1-1, drawn one, lost one, scored six, conceded seven, um, no Kevin De Bruyne, and they look, I think it's fair to say, leaky at the back. Uh, They drew leads in their last game, 1-1, but they conceded 2.57 XG, lost the XG battle there. They lost 5-2 to Leicester, lost the XG battle there, 2.87 conceded. They beat Wolves 3-1 on opening day of the new season, um you know, pretty comprehensively with the underlying metrics as well. So maybe not as good in our favor, but I I think it's fair to say that if there's been a criticism of Arteta, it's maybe a little conservatism. I think there were some people that felt in the league fixture against Liverpool. We could have had a bit more of a go with them. City look vulnerable at the back. They don't have Kevin De Bruyne. It doesn't mean they can't hurt us. Doesn't mean they can't beat us uh, heavily, but would you like to see him have more of a go in this game? Would you like to see Arteta start party, start Ceballos, Put a, an attacking back four lineup out there and go for it, or or am I getting ahead of myself? <laughs> That's what you want. <laughs> That's all right. Should I get what I want? I deserve nice things. Can I have That's nice things? Go. <laughs> Let's just ask me a question and say, "This is what I want, Clive. What do you want?" <laughs> so, like, I, I actually enough about me. Let's talk to you. What do you want to give me? <laughs> I, you know, I don't care. I, I I just like the fact that he's building the foundations and the team properly. 
you know, and he's building it from the back like he should do, and he's building a way of playing like he should do. And he's developing icing on the cake as we speak, right? And this signing, mm. I think, is going to connect a lot of dots and connect a lot of people. So taking from the last game, and Pepe came on and won that game. Let's hope that can continue. You know, I think how we ended that game with winning in behind Saka, Abamyang, and, and Pepe, that, that quite interests me. But then we might start with the old, you know, the, the hybrid back five situation, five channels defensively, five channels attacking me. Kieran Tierney looks like he's going to play. So that'll be really interesting because he's really key to that system. Saka and Maitland Niles have, due to our wonderful England manager, Gareth Southgate, have got a little bit of rest. So they'll be nice and fresh. And so it's all open. And I think we got good players now to make it all happen. Sabias and Party. Party would be interested to see what he does there. Will he go Shaka and Sabias just to get Party to have a look at this game, what it's all about? Um, again, I really want to see him and the the sort of the feeling and the the way this guy's been you know, sort of open armed by an Arsenal fan and really received. I, I just think he's wonderful. Actually, we had a real good period of time to to really embrace him into the club. We haven't seen him yet. I've, I've rarely seen his level of excitement for a signing. Maybe I'm slightly biased because his type of signing is one I think we've needed for many many years. But then. I suddenly found I am not alone and lots and lots and lots of people feel that way and it's it's just wonderful to see the, the global fan base just embrace this guy and I just think I just so hope he, he is the player we all hope he actually is and, and, and perform to a level at Arsenal that maybe even exceeds our expectations but I'm not sure if those expectations could be exceeded because everyone's behind him at the moment so um yeah, I'm really hopeful. But then I say this for every single away game against the top six team. And the last time we won, I think, is it still Saturday? Because all the game against City, mm-hmm. away from home, I think it's still that game. And every time on this podcast, I get excited and think we're going to win. And we don't. So um, I'm going to try to hold back. A good, a good result would be a draw. If you get a win, this team is on the road, mate. It's on the road to something really good. So I'm hopeful. Yeah, I mean... I- it's tough for me because I still think our season comes down to what we do in the smaller games against the smaller teams and beating them up and showing we can do that consistently. Arteta's already proven he can be competitive in the big games, but it's not the big games that are going to get us to top four. I mean, they, they don't hurt. Those points count too. It's the other ones. So I'm really excited this season to see us start to beat up those smaller teams. Maybe City is one of those smaller teams. Tim, is, T- is City a smaller team we're ready to beat up? Um do we go for them? Do we go for this leaky back line? Do we go for this team that seems that right now they don't really have a handle on on keeping teams out? Do we do we take advantage of the no De Bruyne? What do you what do you think we should do and what do you think he will do? So I, I think he'll keep that kind of three four three system, which I wouldn't be um terribly disappointed um to see. Um I I quite like to see Pepe instead of Willian though, um just to just to create that little bit of extra threat. I, I'd really like to see, you know, assuming he's fit enough and everything, I'd like to see Party start this game. Um, I'd like the party to start. Um, and, it's and like the puns write I'd, themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and ordinarily, I'd, I'd be, you know, circumspect about that. And, I, you know, I don't mind the idea of a new signing sitting on the bench his first game. But the reason I'd start him... Uh, so long as he's in, in condition to do so is because I watched the Man City Leeds game and what that really showed is for the first time in a long time you can run through this city team you can run through that midfield Leeds ran through it time and time and time again and this is the first time I've mentioned Santi Cazorla <laughs> there what did we do the last time we won at City Santi Cazorla ran through them we haven't been able to do that since because we haven't had the players to do it and City have probably been too good anyway um, this is like a diseconomies of scale effect here where A, City for the first time are susceptible to exactly that type of play and B, for the first time in about five years, we have a player who can do that. And so... You, you and think, got, you you think Europe- Granit Xhaka can run through their midfield? Is what you're saying to me? No? <laughs> so, you know, like we've got a Europa League game on Thursday night that don't worry about starting Thomas party in that. If you don't want to this for me, like, or, you know, if I don't know if we were playing like, I don't know, Leeds at home or something. Yeah. Okay. Start party on the bench, give him the Europa League game, you know, get him in that way. No, this time start him against city, leave him at, you know, leave him at home for the Europa League um, and, you know, get him some premier league rhythm. But th- this is, 
this is a chance and that that is not to say that city will be weak they will be relatively weak they will be weak relative to their strength um which means it's still going to be a really really tough game and they've still got a better team than us but this because of the players they've got missing, because of the form they're in, because they're still settling in, um, you know, a defence that looks a bit ropey, a midfield that looks a bit ropey. You know, they're dealing with Fernandinho being 35 and Silva's gone and Aguero's not, you know, is injured at the moment and Jesus and Sterling, we're told, might not, uh, probably won't start and De Bruyne won't start. Like, th- this is an opportunity and that doesn't mean to me that we should go absolutely gun ho and go, right, we're better than these because even with those players missing, we're still not. Mm-hmm. I don't think, but we're we're a lot closer, and now we've got a player that I think can hurt them. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm happy to see that system again and to see us, you know, not abandon those principles um, that we've set at the moment and not to get ahead of ourselves. But within that system, I would like to see Thomas Partey and Nicola Pepe start. Yeah, and I mean, maybe go maybe ahead. Saka start team as well. Maybe just maybe yeah. maybe and maybe I'll see the way again because um, but. You know, when we play that system, we don't really play that one system. We play two or three, right? So we should just get used to it and just embrace it because we're able to flex within the game and whether we're in charge or not, when we're on the ball or not. I think sometimes systems, we just, we got them in our mind, they give us a little imprint, but it's not that important. It really isn't. It's all about the players and the balance of players. So by saying Pepe for William, that could be enough for this game. And purely attacking balance that could be enough that little tweak it's got to be Pepe doesn't it I mean seeing the way oh, you I can think. run through their back I mean looking what he did in the Sheffield game I know it's he's not going to score a goal like that every time but we need that explosiveness in behind I mean him and Obama Yang, that's so. the threat I think so um, we all want this player to, to be the player let's not talk about the price but we want it to be the player please we, use his full name to, Clive 72 million pound Pepe <laughs> we need him to be even 45 million would be nice right? you know, so, uh, that that's what we need and we know it's there we know it's there we just like to be a bit more sure when it's going to pop out mm. do you know what I mean so uh, he's coming he's not I, I think it's away. very it's important to be sure when it's going to pop out because if it pops out when you're not expecting it like that just leads to big problems I just lay him up there mate if you yeah, do you not do. Them yeah, in, no, don't them in. smash him home um, yuck uh, yeah look We'll see what he does. My instinct, guys, I think all our instinct, he's going to go with the back three. I bet he doesn't even know if he's going to start party right now, but I think he's got a tickle where he wants to start party and Ceballos would be my guess. Um, I do think he'll go Willian over Pepe. I do think he'll go Aubameyang yeah. on the left and Lacazette up front. And I think this is me just guessing because I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to bitch about it a lot. Maybe not on Twitter. Maybe I'll <laughs> save it for the instant reaction pod. Maybe I'll lose the run of myself and do it on Twitter. That's my guess. Tim, do you think that I've nailed how what my reaction will be there? Or do you think my reaction yeah. will be different? Uh, no, I, I, I think that that will be your reaction. Yeah, yeah. And, and I agree with you. I, I think Willian will start this. Uh, this game all day long. Um, I, I'm not convinced he will start party as much as, much as I'd like to see it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is like quite a predictable team. And, you know, look, maybe he'll think, well, if I keep this... Um, again, I watched that Leeds game and Leeds weren't really in it in the first half and they were kind of lucky to be 1-0 down. And then in the second half, they stepped it up. And, and you know, maybe, maybe he'll think, well, look, let's keep things nice and on an even keel for 60 minutes. And then they haven't, they're not going to have the bench they usually have. And maybe we can bring Partey and Pepe on for the last half an hour and see what happens there. So, um, you know, m- maybe this is about the 14 rather than the 11. Yeah, I, I mean... I think if I had to say what is most important in this game, I think start party, just go for it. You know, I mean, do it. He he adds something that we desperately need. Start Pepe. I think if I had to guess which one of those two I'll get, I actually think I'll get party and not Pepe. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you know what? It, I think that's more likely to. And it may be a case, Tim, like William plays and he keeps it tight and he doesn't do a hell of a lot, but Pepe comes on in the second half and you know runs right through them like like he did against Sheffield and who knows to be fair last season um I watched Chelsea City and um Chelsea played on the break and and Willian ate them alive and I know we've started to think that maybe Willian is is that you know the structure guy who's not very exciting but he can be um in the right scenario and he was brilliant away at City for Chelsea last season so I will have a good laugh if he starts a back four with a midfield three of Ceballos, Party, and Willian, and a front three of Saka, Aubameyang, and Pepe, and then we win seven nil. Um, 
I mean, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but it's in the range of outcomes. Uh, score score prediction, Tim? Um, I think it'll be one all. Hmm. I think it'll be a draw. Clive? <laughs> we got when have I ever not predicted a win? <laughs> two one Arsenal every time. I'm going to go four two to the Arsenal. I think it's going to be a wild, wild game that leaves us euphoric, celebrating our title hopes, only to uh, probably lose in midweek in some team in Eastern Europe. Um, I'm kidding. Not about the part of us winning, though. We're going to win. Uh, okay, that'll do it. We'll have an instant reaction pod for patrons um, right after the game because it's an instant reaction. And then a full pod on Monday. If you want to watch the two Thomas Party scouting videos, Clive did an absolute home run bang up job on them. And I could not have been happier to be along for the ride on those. I think you'll love them. And uh, for those of you who have signed up, thank you so much. Like it is it is a hell of a community. And and uh, I don't know if you know, took a week off to just sort of refresh and and get the mojo back. And uh, a lot of kind words shared during that time. For those of you who didn't get a chance to share kind words and, and would have liked to pile on with, with some abuse, please do. Because uh, I love that too. Just the fact that anybody cares about this podcast enough to have any feedback is uh, an honor. There's no other way to say it. So thank you so much for that. Tim's on Twitter. Stoberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. Paul and Scott will be back in the future, uh, as will I, as will you, hopefully, uh, to discuss this glorious win coming at the weekend. So we love you, and we will talk to you after Arsenal 10. City nil. No.